he had been told that the prisoner was being used uh, by the CIA for training. And we did get a uh, we did get a, a, a game returned for replacement because it was been damaged. And the mailing address uh, to return it to was a P.O. box in Langley, Virginia, which is where the CIA was located. <laughs> you know, you have stimulus to perform an action. And then if you perform that action, you get a reward. And they're immediately presented with, with, with new stimulus so that it happens over and over and over again. You know, that constant reward loop, if that, get, if that reward loop involves a, a payment and that payment happens frequently enough, then making the payment becomes a habit. And that, that feeds into gambler addiction. And they gave me a, a copy of Heroes of My Magic 2 to play at home. And so I brought it home. It was my first experience with it. I brought it home and played it over the week. And I was scared. The reason why I was scared is I, this, I thought, this is a fantastic game. Right. There's no way I can make a game that's better than Heroes of My Magic 2. So today I'm joined by someone I'm really excited to talk about, talk to, um, Mr. David Mullick. Did I say your last name correct? You said it correct. Not everyone does. So, okay. Uh, so kudos on you for doing that. <laughs> Good start. Um, you've worked on many games. Some people might know your work from The Prisoner. Um, other people might know your work from Disney's DuckTales. And then, of course, the iconic Heroes Might and Magic franchise. Is there anything that's bigger that I might have missed? Well, the, 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 a couple of those are pretty big. There's also, a, a, I worked on I Have No Mouth and I'm Scream with Harlan Elsa. And uh, uh, when I was at Activision, I produced Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Right, based on a Halo engine, right? That was Or not Halo, sorry, Half-Life engine, right? Half-Life, yeah, the Valve engine. Right, very cool. Right. Well, yeah, so I guess starting off, I, you know, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. But I guess the most fundamental question is, how did you get into game design and, and that? Well, you know, I, I grew up, when I grew up, uh, it was it was uh, before video games were really a thing. The only thing I was a Magnavox Odyssey. I played a lot of board games. Um, we had a whole closet through of every single board game I think was uh, was available. And I wound up designing some of my own board games just, just for playing among my family. So that, that would be my, my, my actual start in board game design. And then eventually I got into college doing Dungeons and Dragons. So... That, that's how I learned the fundamentals of game design. How I actually got into it professionally was I had uh, I'd been taking some computer courses. And, uh, and when I was in a, bu- in, a, in a business computing course, my uh, professor caught me using the uh, university computer for printing out pictures of the Starship Enterprise and generating poetry. And uh, he called me into his office. And I thought I was going to be in trouble, but actually he offered me a job. He and a couple of the other professors at Cost State Northridge had opened up one of the first computer stores to open in Los Angeles. He offered me as a job as a clerk. And so uh, as, as well as doing some, uh, some contract programming for him for some clients of his. And as I, when I worked in the store, I met a couple of people that started some of the very first game publishing companies. And one of them asked me to uh, uh, develop some games for him. And there was a company called Edgeware. And uh, I, I developed a number of games all while I was going to college. I think the first one was, uh, was a, uh, actually a uh, expansion for a text-based role-playing game called Space. So I created some additional modules for that. Uh, and then I created a uh, simulation, an oil crisis simulation called Windfall. It was based upon the oil crisis that was going on at the time. And it was based, based upon what I learned in in a, in a, uh, in a uh, economics class I was taking. And then, uh, then I uh, developed a simulation of running a television network and scheduling shows at the proper time slots to get the best ratings with the proper lead-ins. That was based on a mass communications class I took. Cool. So I, I, I made three games on the Apple II, programmed my, myself in, uh, in BASIC, and uh, what graphics there were, uh, I, I designed. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So I, I uh, they only took like a couple of weeks each, uh, but those those were my first professional games. And then when I graduated 
Edgeware hired me on as a game designer programmer full time. So that's how I got my start in the industry. You know what's interesting? I had another developer on, Sandy Peterson, and um, he also started with board games, which it seems like that was a theme in the early days of video game design. It seems like a lot of people start out with board games and then work their way into, you know, digital route and creating actual video games. That's true, especially all of us, those of us were, were old enough that, that board games are really all we had access to at home. It's like a first passion into the, the real big... Well, actually, I heard you talk about a different passion, which was filmmaking, and and you didn't really want to go into that route because you were worried about jobs, but I guess you didn't see the obvious flaw in your logic, which was like video games, there were probably not that many jobs either at the time, right? Well, actually, no, What uh, it's true about, I was originally interested in filmmaking, and in fact, when, when I was growing up, I made some Super 8 movies uh, on, my, on, my own, on my own camera. Uh but yeah, I got discouraged when I saw the long, long line of people pre-registrating for the radio, television, film program because I thought there's no way all these people uh, would get get jobs in the industry. Right. So I wanted to do something more practical, which is why I enrolled in computer programming courses. But I, I originally didn't think I'd be getting into the video games. I mean, there were, I didn't even know there were such things as computer games at the time. Uh, so it was uh, it was really going after a more lucrative or more stable profession than that. I didn't think about video ga- programming video games. But was everyone aware of the boom that was the computer age and the digital age ahead? You know, did other people around you also have similar ideas of you know going into the space, or did you see yourself kind of as a pioneer to to go down this road? Well, um, the, the, um, certainly I, I I got involved in this very start of the home computer uh, industry, but. Uh, certainly wasn't a visionary. I was more more or less inspired by a uh, by a uh, uh, how and why wonder book about robots and uh, electronic and electronic uh, uh, machines uh, that that one that I read when I was growing up about uh, you know using gigantic room sized computers to do what would now be very simple calculations. So that was more my inspiration at the time. Uh, I was probably you know. I, I was an observer and, 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 and of, of what was happening in, in, the, uh, uh, in the computer industry and, and what was happening with technology, but uh, certainly was, wasn't anything I prophesized. Right. What, I, just, what, I just rode the wave. Yeah, fair enough. What was working, I guess, in the video game space at that time? You know, probably smaller teams, maybe more hands-on experience, maybe more long hours. I'm just curious what the atmosphere was like at this, you know, at the at the starting age of basically video game studios. Well, yeah, it was when I started, it was just one, one person, one game because graphics, you know, such graphics as there were didn't require that, that much artistic skills. Um, and uh, certainly not audio. So uh, the, the tools were so primitive having being really talented, probably when it, uh, when, when it, if your talents as an artist or a music person probably wouldn't come through at the time anyway. So a lot of us amateurs, someone who, no, I, I very very meager uh, art and audio talent. So, uh, but uh, you know that's that's all you needed at the time. Um, so it was, yeah, one person handling everything. I did design, the programming, and what little artwork and audio there was in my games. And the first games I made, you know, it was anywhere from three days to two weeks per game, which I usually did. I worked vampire hours. So I, I would I, it wouldn't be unusual for me to start working like eight p.m. at night. Oh really. Uh, and, and then working to like four in the morning and then going to school the next day. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's what it was like as a, as a indie or a contract developer. Uh, so, uh, but, but once I got employed full time, it was, it was actually a fairly, you know, like it was like a, a, a nine to five or nine to six job. Uh, when, when I worked at Edgeware, there were, there were some, some days when I worked late at night and some days where I worked weekends. Um, but yeah, no, well, there were, there weren't, there weren't terrible crunch hours. Uh, not until, uh, I, uh, eventually got into, uh, uh, a bigger studio, at much right? bigger company studios, like the Activisions and the 3DOs that that's where, where really, uh, started counting, uh, crunch time. But yeah, in the early, it was, it was, it was, there wasn't nearly as much pressure. Uh, because there weren't as many dollars involved, uh, and uh, you know, the average we didn't have advertising campaigns where where 
you, you would announce a launch date six months ahead of time. So the, there wasn't that, 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 that drop dead date that you had to adhere to no matter what. And uh, also, I, I felt like I had a lot more freedom in my game design. I, I mean, I did things starting off that I would never think about doing today, where I would just design as I went, or I, I, I would try some things that I wasn't sure would be fun for people. But I thought it, was, uh, it would be an uh, intriguing idea to try to implement. Uh, so, uh, uh, and certainly there, were, there weren't that many pre-established genres where, you know, uh, you know everything follows, as, you know, if, if you're going to you do this genre that has these actions and it must be similar, have similar roles to the other games in the same genres. Uh, in the early days when genres were just being defined, uh, there, there weren't that many templates to follow. Uh, so uh, it allowed for a lot more experimentation than in later in my career, where it was uh, yeah, you, you followed the you followed very very well established game design patterns. Right. Um, clearly, you did something right with those vampire hours because you created a really popular game at the time. Maybe not a cult classic, but a game that was well respected, well recognized. I kind of wanted to read a old review if I can from the time. I guess I, I guess people probably don't know what this game is, or maybe don't know what it's about. I think the review actually does a pretty good job of encapsulating kind of what it's about. So uh, what puts this game head and shoulders above other adventures is that while the player is seeking the information needed to escape from the island, the computer actively is seeking the information that the uh, that it will make the player lose the game. The dual challenges of learning about the island while avoiding the subtle and not so subtle traps laid by the computer make the game both interesting and exciting. This was soft talk magazine this is i can't remember what year i pulled this from but i thought it was a great kind of description of the game do you think that's a fair way to describe the game that's a good way yeah you're describing the prisoner which uh, uh came out in 1979 so the, the review would have been around then yeah that was something that that was that was a game i could not design today no no one would ever no publisher would ever defend such a game it was based upon the british television series the prisoner that uh that was rerunning on, on my local PBS station, I was going to college, and I was absolutely obsessed with it. And that was uh, that was a that was a TV series about somebody we assume is a spy, but it's not confirmed, uh, who resigns from his position, but as he's as he's packing up to to go off someplace, uh, he is uh, he's, he's 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 gassed and rendered unconscious, and he works wakes up in this uh, uh, beachside resort where. Uh, yeah, where 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 um, he's just referred to as a number, number six, and everyone else is referred to as numbers, and everything there is designed to try to find out why he resigned, and so uh, and and it, it dealt with issues such as individuality uh, and and uh, and uh, how uh, how uh, uh, various authority figures uh, try to make us conform, and what we can do to to to, to resist that that conformance. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 and strengthen our own individuality. So I had in college, I was very taken with those ideas and I really wanted to make a game that emulated that. So, uh, I, um, uh, I tried to, to replicate the feeling of the show in that no matter what the hero number six does, he always winds up back in the same place. So he's, he's constantly losing. He's constantly being thwarted. It's like a so I wanted right? to make like a groundhog yeah day. yeah 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 except it was separate adventures right each time so it experienced different things so uh i wanted to create a game which no matter what you did you always wind up back at your starting point you were constantly being frustrated but still balancing out that frustration with anticipation of 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 learning new things trying to figure out the rules is there any way to possibly succeed um so it it violated all of the all all of the uh, the wisdom we've since learned about game design, which players have to feel they 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 can succeed, and uh, we have to keep players engaged. And always, you know, when you complete one goal, present them with a new goal that they know they can achieve. And here I was doing everything that was completely the opposite of that. And I I don't know how I did it, but somehow I I, I managed to create a game that was frustrating infuriating but still engaging that, that kept you wanting to try so uh, i it, it was unusual in that regard right but its success was a surprise to you or no um 
No, I, I wouldn't say it was a surprise. I, I just I, I made the game because I had to. Right. And it was a game that I just it just poured out of me. I just designed as I went, uh, and just release it to the public and just to see what they thought. And I was, I was just very happy with the positive reception that it has. And that fact that there are some people around who still remember it today, 40 years later. Right. That's a true staple of, of great games, right? That they're even, even today I watched some footage of someone playing. I'm like, yeah, I could definitely see why this was very unique and very interesting at the time. And you know, if, if I was getting my first computer and this is the first game I had, it would probably blow my little mind, you know, like, if, <laughs> so you know, the thing I'm probably proudest of in that is, is the dialogue engine I put in, where you could type in things very freeform, and and the character you're interacting with uh, would respond to you. And so uh, to, uh, to uh, a lot of reviewers, uh, they thought there was very sophisticated artificial intelligence behind it. It was more a case that uh, uh, the writing, my, my, my writing style for this game was, was to be very, use, use a lot of lot of uh, uh use a lot of dialogue that was very open to interpretation so no matter what he typed in it seemed to fit and seemed to have have deeper meaning to it so it seemed seemed to have greater depth uh and sophistication but you almost really made did. a dummy proof right you kind of gave them the option to type whatever the hell they want instead of a simple like one or zero command right yeah yeah <laughs> pretty much pretty much it, what were the challenges of making a game during that time? Be uh, because today you look at a game like that and you think, wow, like some kid, you know, with a, I don't know, C++ can probably do this in an hour. But at the time, was there a lot of challenges m making a game like that with so many different, you know, outcomes, the the maze gen generating all the time differently, right? Yeah, well, it's if you want to do anything sophisticated uh, or, or you really need to fast processing, you had to do it in, uh, write it in assembly language. Uh, which is more complicated than, than 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 you know a higher level language. So I would so uh, I, 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 yes, I do maze generators. I my uh, my my dialogue parser, and then uh, later on when I when I did a more sophisticated version, all the graphics I had to do an assembly language, and that involved you know loading in individual memory values into the accumulator and then if i wanted to divide i shifted oh over God. the right <laughs> positions and and so yeah it was it was a very you really had to think at a very simplistic level breaking you breaking down complex problems into very very uh simple steps and so that that was a challenge and then you know Adding up you know, the times it took to do each command in the processor, so that uh, trying to optimize things uh, to run as quickly as possible. So that 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 provided a little bit of a technical challenge, but it was, it was a fun challenge to do. It's like puzzle solving. So so I enjoyed that quite a bit. Uh, also, because we didn't have very large teams, uh, the, we didn't have a lot of testing beforehand. And so, uh, yeah, the, too often you, you introduce games with, 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 with bugs. And uh, there, in fact, in The Prisoner, uh, my first version of The Prisoner, there was a, there was a bug in it where uh, there were basic, although you could do hundreds of things in any different order throughout the game, there were basically four main paths through the game. And uh, turns out one of those paths led to a, a, a condition where you couldn't win. So that was a, that was a bug on my part that, that didn't catch because I didn't. Because you were the bug tester test and the system. developer, right? <laughs> you Correct, were, which yeah. you should never do. Right, right. So, so, uh, so yeah. So I, I fixed that in a later version. But back in those days, you know, to get a version, you had to go right to the publisher, say, you know, I've got a bug. Here's my disc. You know, send me a new one. It wasn't a case of just automatically uh, uh, you know, downloading a patch and. In real time to get things fixed. You also have a fourth breaking the fourth wall thing in the game, right? If you say that this is a video game, the game kind of you win, right? Obviously, to you have to play a few missions or you have to play around a little bit. Was this one of the first games with uh, that element, the fourth breaking the fourth wall in video games? I don't know many that that have. Um, I, I I kind of broke the fourth wall in a couple of ways, and so the the goal of the game. Uh, and the TV show, well, it was mirrored the TV show in that you, uh, the, the, the protagonist, number six, could, uh, could never reveal why he resigned. And so I wanted to, I wanted to kind of mirror that by get, uh, 
encoding your reasons for resigning as a, as a number. So you're given a three digit number that under no circumstances could you ever type in, could you ever select, could you ever reveal in any any given way. And so, uh, so yeah, the, and then I put in a lot of little traps in it to try to get the player to, 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 to type in or select this number. One of them is you're playing along and suddenly the game crashes. And, you know, let's say your number is, is your resignation code was number 415. So you're playing along, it crashes, and it says syntax error in line number 415. And if you were like most Apple users, you would type in list 415. Well, turns out that wasn't a real crash. It was just <laughs> a trick to get you to, to reveal your number. And so you could lose the game by doing that. Uh, then finally, at the very end of the game, um, it was uh, at the very end of the game, uh, you, once you've, you've, you've reached a certain level and uh, you have a dialogue with the person that's running the, the, the whole experience, uh, who I call the caretaker, you have a, a kind of a philosophical uh, uh, discussion with, with, with the character. And if you type in uh, the island, which is the place you're at. The island is a computer game, or the island is a computer. That's that's what you need to do to win. You have to real. You have to undergo the realization that you are playing a video game or a computer game. And then there's a there's there's a cut scene that plays in which it says, uh, "Now that you made this realization, you can unplug your computer, and now you're free." And it was based around the message that the reason why you're a prisoner is because you've chosen to be a prisoner to this, this experience because you've chosen to play it. And all, to, all it takes to be free is just a side, I'm not going to play anymore. So that, that that was kind of a meta message within the game. Right. That's pretty pretty clever. And I don't know, I was curious because I couldn't find online. It's kind of a weird search. What's the first game to break the fourth wall? And then I, you know, I'm thinking back, I, I can't think of any other game in that time period that had similar mechanics. And I would later on, you know, think about Metal Gear Solid. I don't know if you know, uh, in that game, Raiden turn off the game. There's one part in, in the in that. There's Batman Arkham Asylum where like you're having these weird hallucinations, and it, it was it's curious to see where that stems from, where that idea of breaking the fourth wall in a video game stems from because it probably happened in movies, right? You know, but oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I've I've rarely seen in video games, and I was I was probably the first person to do it in a, in a major way. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the game had had a cult following and, and, and was a bestseller for a couple of months. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think it was influential enough that uh, many, many people thought about it much afterwards in designing their own games. So uh, it, it may have been a first, but unfortunately, it wasn't as influential as I would have thought. Well, I, I have no authority, but in my eyes, it's the first game. So if that if that means something. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> Because uh, I, I do think it was. Yeah. Um, so another interesting part, which is they talk about how the computer is, you know, trying to stifle you or potentially collect information about you. I think it's really interesting to see where that's, you know, gone fa- gone down today and in today's games where, unlike before, you didn't have any information about the player. Whereas today, with mobile games, with computer games, you have so much information about their play habits where their attention is. What what does a prisoner game today look like in your eyes? Have you ever thought about what you could do with such a wealth of information and, and kind of freedom and design? Yeah, well, if, if I were making it today, it would be more about invasion of privacy and trying to motivate people by examining their past behaviors and making predictions about them. So it would be a little bit more, in, instead of a more of a, Instead of a government conspiracy, it would be more involved about how how big data is being used to uh, to to uh, uh, influence your behavior. And uh, I would have as a player goal both resisting that those influences uh, as well as trying to safeguard one's privacy. So kind of similar similar themes to uh, to the original game but uh, in, in kind of in a, in a different venue. Right. Does it worry you today at all what games have kind of become with certain games like, you know, FIFA games with microtransactions and some mobile games with, you know, kind of 
predatory loot boxes. Are you at all concerned about that kind of stuff? Do you pay any attention to that stuff? I'm certainly, I'm certainly concerned. Uh, in the case of where kids are playing games, um, and certainly it's 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 bad game design if you uh, if uh, if you the only way to win is if you have to pay more so that instead of challenging your skills and and really appealing to the, the sort of our, our motivations we're playing the game our motivations for 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 novelty and challenge and and uh, and uh, socializing with others and dealing with threats and such. Instead, it's more about pay cash to win. Uh, then, then, then I, then it worries me. Uh, it doesn't worry me as so much as you know, you, if you if it provides a, a, a basic experience, and then maybe you pay more to open up new experiences. But uh, if uh, if it's a case of causing people to invest their time. Uh, and th- they feel that the only way to pay off that that time investment is is to pay actually money. Uh, that that does worry me, especially when it does take advantage of people that really don't make good decisions for themselves either because they are too young or or or, or, or you know have have other other issues uh, with themselves. I, I don't li- I don't want to see people getting taken advantage of. It's really unfortunate because there are such great examples of really good video game design that still happen today with, because I played, I play all kinds of games. I played everything from FIFA to, you know, the latest Mario game on the Switch. And it's such a crazy difference between the two where one is continuing, continuously forcing you into this system of microtransactions and, you know, fueling your dopamine. Whereas like Mario, your reward for beating these things is usually you get a new map or you get a new level in the game. That's how good the game is. And you're like, awesome. I get to play it more. Like this is, this is the reward. I don't have to put any money in. My reward for playing this game is more of this game. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you made an interesting point about the uh, dopamine. Yeah. If, 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 it, if, it, if you have to pay so often in little tiny mi- microtransactions uh, within the, within the core game loop, and the core game loop is where, you know, you have stimulus to perform an action, and then if you perform that action, you get a reward, and they're immediately presented with with, with new stimulus, so that it happens over and over and over again. You know that constant reward loop. If that get if that reward loop involves a, a payment, and that payment happens frequently enough, then making the payment becomes a habit, and that, that feeds into gambler addiction, which is which uh, is, is is problematic for me. If the payments are spaced out far enough that it's not part of that 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 flow that players get engaged in, and so that they can make decisions a little bit more uh, uh, intelligently as opposed to out of habit, uh, I think that's a lot better. I think video game developers in general are people of pretty respectable ethics and they see these things and they see these dangers and the power they have in basically coding a game, whereas a company looks at the bottom line and says, well, this year you're gonna need to make another billion dollars and find a way to do it. And we don't care how you do it. You know, it's, it's really interesting times. Always. That's always a challenge between, you know, the, the business needs and the and creative needs and, and, and ethical considerations. Uh, so it's, you know, if when people aren't thinking about the ethical considerations, uh, it's, you know, they need to be reminded. So, uh, yeah, that, that's part. That's part of the job of the game developer is 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 where where in the cases where the business business side isn't thinking about that. And I'm not saying they never do because they're interested in, in many business people do think long term and worried about company reputation. Uh, uh, but uh, when they're not, uh, it's, it's the game developer's job to remind them of, of that aspect of. Uh, or step away from working on something they don't feel comfortable with working on, right? It's it goes from that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if if you can't make those changes, it's better to see if you can redirect it sure. toward more something like you're working on. But if there's a if you're constantly hitting a brick wall and doing doing work that you're not proud of and don't enjoy, uh, maybe it is time to step away. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to talk to you about, it's um, a little bit off topic, but you're doing some VR work. Is that correct? No, not, uh, it, not currently. No, no, no. Uh, before? Or am I mis- mistaken? 
I, I'm, 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 we're, we're, uh, was working on a virtual world. Yeah. But not virtual reality. Okay, then maybe I was mistaken. But my question was more um, the prisoner and virtual reality. Have you ever given that any thought? I feel like that would be a perfect combination. Oh, that that certainly would. I mean, virtual reality does make it more make make experiences very immersive. Um, augmented reality would also yes. be very cool. Right. Be able to you know be able to take a game story and superimpose it over the real world, so it seems more realistic and more plausible. Uh, I I think that would be that could be a really cool experience. Uh, I I do like virtual reality. I, I, I try to experience a lot of a lot of virtual reality act, uh, applications, and you know, going I went to the void when when the void was available, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, a number of other virtual reality experiences. I I, I really do enjoy those, um, but uh, uh, no, not not had an opportunity to actually work on on one myself yet. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully, maybe one day. Um... I did also want to ask this. Yeah, I figured was, there's still time. Um, I had a one question that's kind of a silly one, but I don't know. Maybe you have an update on this. Maybe you don't. That the prisoner was used for a CSI or CSI for um, FBI training uh, videos or training, I guess, sessions for agents. Uh, my uh, the the owner of Edgeware, uh, or or the 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 the, uh, the, the CEO of Edgeware at the time told me that he had been told that the prisoner was being used uh, by the CIA for training. And we did get a, uh, we did get a, a, a game returned for replacement because it was been damaged. And the mailing address uh, to return it to was a PO box in Langley, Virginia, which is where the CIA was located. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I don't know how, uh, how reliable a narrator my boss was, uh, but but I did uh, I I did uh, see that that the game uh, uh, the replacement game that that had to go back to Langley, Virginia. So uh, maybe so, maybe it was using it. As was he training. known for making these crazy? Did he tell you anything else crazy that <laughs> about the game? About the that, no no he told me he told me a number of other crazy things, but not about uh, not about the game. about that game. <laughs> not that you can share. <laughs> No, it will be too off topic. Fair. Um, well, if there's anyone, this is the power of the internet. If there's anyone that worked in the FBI, you know, during the 80s, 90s, please, for the love of God, just send me a DM or something. To, I want to know because that would be <laughs> that would be un- unreal. We can add that to the Yeah, I want to know too. Yeah, right? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we want to investigate this a bit more, you know? Put this, put this in a show or something, you know? <laughs> so then you moved on to Prisoners or the Prisoner 2. And um, yeah, how did that go? How was the second, you know, rendition of that? Well, uh, the the original prisoner was all text based and included text graphics, which means that to make graphics, I use symbols and and um, filled in uh, filled in uh, 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 blocks and such. Uh, but uh, for prisoner two, I uh, uh, Apple II graphics. Uh, for for uh, for making it, and uh, so I created a graphics engine, an assembly language to support that. I also wanted to do something different story wise. I just didn't want it to be just a reskin, so I made it a little bit more of a satire of other computer games that were out there. And so um, there was a there was there was a case of where you would uh, go into a series of rooms that were uh, there were parodies of. Sierra Online adventure games, and there were uh, there were there were other locations that that oh there were there was a uh, when you were if you escaped from the island you would be chased by a character that resembled Pac Man a little bit, really? <laughs> um, a twisted version of Pac Man. Uh, so I, I, I tried to satirize computer games, kind of played up on the uh, the the original ending uh, that you chosen to be uh, uh, chosen to be imprisoned by by this particular video game well so for the the remake i uh, made it so that a little bit more you you choose to be uh, uh imprisoned by the various video games you play so it was a little bit more of a of a parody uh uh with a satirical message behind it uh plus plus uh improved graphics did you feel like this was a better version of the game or or did you feel like it's really hard to replicate 
um, uh, you know, the first one or top its success, let's say? Um, I think uh, creatively, the first version was better. But technically, uh, like, gra- like graphically and, you know, tech- coding. Technically, this, yeah, technically, the second version was better. And the licenses, apparently, you, you told, uh, or someone from your office told um, the actual, the prisoner BBC uh, people that they wanted to make a themed restaurant. Is that true? Yeah. It, it, in those days, <laughs> uh, I was very unsophisticated about copyright. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, if, if you saw, saw a television show or movie, uh, it, you can make an adaptation with, <laughs> of it, with, you know, without any permission. Um, and the, legally, that's not true. That definitely isn't true. <laughs> but movie studios and television uh, producers didn't pay attention to what's happening in video games. Well, although I, I, even though I wasn't aware of the legalities 40 years ago, it bugged me ethically. Uh, and so what I want, I, I, when, when they asked me to make a remake, I, I told uh, Edgeware, uh, we, we have to get permission to do this. And so what, the way they, they got permission is they had their marketing uh, marketing manager call up ITC Productions, which which owned the rights to the prisoner, and ask and, and say, We're, uh, we want to make a, a prisoner-themed restaurant. Do you have any issue with this? And they said, no, no, go ahead. So they took that to mean, well, it's okay to do a video game then. <laughs> uh, again, not true. I mean, that that's legally, that's completely, completely invalid, but that's, that's what happened. But uh, we got no repercussions from it. So after the, you know, the success of the first game and the, the second game, what did you do from that point on? You went on a few different games, Wilderness, A Survival Adventure, DuckTales, were you just looking for other studios, other challenges? Why did you leave the first studio, Edgeware? Well, the reason why why I left it, I loved working at Edgeware. I, I worked there for five years and, and made made a, a number of games uh, there, as well as as a number of a lot of educational software. That was that was the company's main business was educational software. Uh, so made a lot of products. Um, most of which I, I was I was a designer of. I eventually moved away from programming, and had programmers working under me. But uh, that, that was a, a very good time. But we were we were bought out by another company, uh, Peachtree Software in Atlanta, and because they wanted to break into the home market, but they didn't understand the home market and didn't know how to market to the home market. And so, uh, uh, I mean, they. They took all of our games and educational software and put it in the exact same packaging as their accounting software, <laughs> as, as one indication of, of, of how unsophisticated they were about it. Uh, so within a year, they had, they had uh, driven us out of the ground, uh, driven us into the ground, and so uh, and, and disbanded the company. So a group of us Edgewarians, four of us, got together and formed our own company called Electric Transit uh, to make to publish 3D simulation games, and one of those games was. Uh, Wilderness a Survival Adventure, which was a first-person, real-time, uh, 3D uh, adventure game uh, and, and simulation that was actually developed for Edgeware to be published by Edgeware, but we obtained the rights to it. And the uh, one of the authors of that game became a partner in our company. And so we, we, we went and we, uh, we, we added some uh, additional features to it. And, uh, and published it ourselves. And then we uh, published a, another game also developed by a, uh, a, a outside party called Lunar Explorer, which was a, a moon landing simulator. That also was originally brought to Edgeware, but we, we added some features to it and we published it. Sorry to interrupt you. Did, did they have the same features in the sense of, you know, hunger meter, um, craft systems, other kind of, let's say, early um, features of early mechanics in, in video games. The, are, are you credited with any of those as one of the first ones to have a hunger system or a craft system? Oh, there definitely was a hunger system. In fact, there was an entire model right. of, 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 the, uh, of, of the human body and health. So that involved water and food and exposure to the elements and uh, injuries and how that affected you, uh, how, how each of those... Each, you know, each of those problems over time would affect your overall health 
and then how, how you would regain your health uh, over time. And there was, there was a crafting system of sorts where you could combine different, different objects together um, and to create uh, uh, useful, new useful objects, you know, like uh, combine together, a, I don't know, a string and, 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 and stick and make a fishing rod, for example. So it was, it was that level of crafting uh, in it. Uh, but it was, uh, I'll use my, uh, my uh, English language parsing system so that you, you typed in commands for doing each, each, each of these things. So it might be, uh, you know, use, uh, you use, use, use wood to make fishing rod, use fishing rod to, you know, to fish. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, there was a crafting system and yeah, health system and all that, but it was all, all controlled by, uh, by, uh, by English parser system. Was there anything like that at the time or was this like, it's, you know, the big appeal to the game, the revolutionary kind of new systems. There were, there certainly were simulations at the time and, and goodness, there were great adventure games at the time. Um, but, uh, I think ours was a technical breakthrough. Uh, our, our uh, first person 3D graphics. I don't think there was anything else quite like that at the time. Um, uh, and uh, just the, com- the combination of, of simulation and adventure game, I don't think have been done before. That's crazy to, to, to me, like to, to where, have, where have this has gone today, where you have games like PUBG that are open 3D, you know, games with seven different systems, your hunger system, your health system, your water system, whatever. You, there's games that have so much more detail now, but that's kind of interesting to see where it originally came from. Where was you guys just making this little game together, you know, a couple of you creating a brand new system that would continue to be used for who knows how many years afterwards. Well, uh, it was, it was, it was an award-winning game. One, one, uh, one like from family competing magazine, best, best, uh, uh, I think best learning game award and, and from another, another comp, another magazine, best adventure game of the year award. So it won a couple of awards, but, uh, uh, Unfortunately, I don't think it was, it was it was another case of not being all that influential. I don't think uh, other game designers uh, referred back to our game and making their own game, uh, whatever similarities there were in later games. I think were, was completely coincidental. Okay, fair enough. Um, then you went on to work for Disney a little bit. I am um, I understand that it was a lot of art behind your work or artistic work. Well, yeah, well, well certainly, yeah. Well, on Disney projects, it, it definitely is based on art because all of our products were either based upon Disney films, Disney television series, or, or Disney characters. Yeah, I joined Disney as its very first uh, game producer uh, in 1987, I think it was. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, a lot of our games were uh, were done with outside publishers, so they would license various properties from us, and uh, my job as a producer would be to supply them with reference artwork and scripts and record voiceover uh, audio if they needed it, uh, and then review review all of their work to make sure everything was on model. But then later we opened up our own publishing division. And so we would publish our own ga- our own games. We use outside developers to do it, uh, to make the games. But uh, yeah, we, we we eventually published our own. And yeah, our work was was a big consideration working with Disney. Right. Was was Disney kind of you know newbies, new people to the scene because they were trying to get into the video game space and they were looking for someone who's already made you know quite a few quality games and they were looking for your expertise while trying to you know combine with their brand, I guess. Yeah, because when when they they had they had been involved with video games before, especially educational software before, and so originally they hired educators to be the uh, be the liaison between Disney and, and the various software publishers. Uh, but uh, I, I was the first person they had hired who actually had uh, computer game and video game experience. And uh, everyone, everyone else they hired after me also had that kind of experience. So they, they, yeah, they, they moved away from hiring educators to, to hiring game people. You're, you're a man of many firsts, deceptively many, many firsts, it seems, or maybe even uncredited firsts, un, un, unfairly. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's just by virtue of having gone there early. Yeah, right. Fair enough. And then after Disney, I, I mean, I have to talk about this. This is a game that I played in in my childhood a lot and as you know a lot of people from eastern europe which is where i'm originally from it's almost like a religious game played in in the balkans and in that area so 
how did you start working on, you know, Heroes Mind Magic 3? How did you enter 3DO Studios? Heroes of Mind Magic 3. Wow. Well, I, I was, uh, I, uh, at the time, before I joined it, I was working at a company called uh, Cyber Dreams with that, that made a lot of games based upon famous names from science fiction, fantasy, and horror, like H.R. Giger and, and Harlan Ellison and, uh, and Wes Craven and such. But uh, that company, although we were creatively successful, not not financially successful, especially toward the end. And so as that company was uh, was slowly dying, a, uh, a former programmer who worked at, at the company, who had moved on to work at 3DO's New World Computing uh, Studio, contacted me and said, hey, they're, they're looking for a producer. You want to send me your resume so that I can submit you. So and uh, that, that's been the case of, of 80% of the jobs I've gotten in the game industry. It's always been either being referred by or told about the job by somebody I, I, I used to work with. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I sent them in and uh, met with uh, John Van Canaham, who was one of the founders of the company. And in fact, John and I had met before, like three or four years before, we were both on a game design panel at the, at the, at the Game Developers Conference. Uh, and we, we we talked to each other afterwards. And yeah, we, we should work together and get some time. So it turned out this time what was the time, and they brought me on to work on uh, to to build a brand new team to uh, to create a uh, the uh, a new sequel in the Heroes of Might and Magic franchise. When he talked, so, did he tell uh, you about Heroes? Sorry to interrupt you, but this is kind of interesting. Did, when you guys talked, did he talk about Heroes? Was that still in the works, or did you know anything about Heroes Might and Magic? Uh, I had. Well, when we met, uh, he certainly told me what the project was, and they gave me a, a copy of Heroes of My Magic 2 to play at home. And so I brought it home. It was my first experience with it. I brought it home and played it over the week. And I was scared. The reason why I was scared is I, this, I thought, this is a fantastic game. Right. There's no way I can make a game that's better than Heroes of My Magic 2. So I thought, all right what can I at least add to a sequel? And uh, the, the one thing that, that I was probably disappointed by was that the artwork looked to me a couple of years behind the time. So I wanted to moder- modernize the look of the game. So I thought that's, that's what I mainly focus on. That's what I'd bring to it. Uh, so, uh, so that way when, when I, I, I felt confident to accept the position of uh, being the producer of the sequel. And then I, I built my own team uh, for creating it. Uh, they had already hired a designer, Greg Fulton, who, who was absolutely fantastic. But I, I brought in some some new programmers, and I went through the uh, through the uh, the art the uh, art art team and, and picked out a uh, art director and uh, picked out who I wanted to be working on on my project. So uh, uh, I, I put together what I thought was a really good team for doing uh, the sequel to it. And as it turned out, probably Heroes of My Magic Three is even more popular than Heroes of My Magic Two was. Yeah, 100%. so uh, I thought we were successful, and yeah, it's it's uh, it, yeah, it was successful enough. It's still popular today, and in, in particular in Eastern Europe, you know, twenty years later, still playing it. Uh, in fact, I'm I'm going to a uh, I'm going to a conference in uh, in Ukraine uh, in December to talk about the making of Heroes of My Magic 3. So, Sorry, I missed that. So Could be, you say it again? Please? Whoops, my Siri just went off. Sorry right. about Siri's like, Ukraine? What? Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll, yeah, so I'll be, uh, I'll be, be in that part of the world uh, talking about Heroes of My Magic 3. That's unbelievable, especially the fact that you're talking about the art direction and, and wanting to really step that up going from the second to the third game because I think the art and the style of the game today is regarded as kind of timeless and it, it's aged very gracefully, whereas some games, they have not aged so well. Is that something you even thought about when you made the game, how it's going to age or like, or do you like look back today and say, wow, this game is still looks pretty good considering it's 30 years or 20 years old. I never think about how a game is going to age because the lifetime of most games is only a year or two. If you're lucky. Yeah. So yeah, if you're lucky. So I, I don't worry about how it's going to age. I want it to look contemporary. Is it good when it's released will it appeal to gamers at that time. So, because that's that's where the money's going to be made when it's first released. 
So that that's what I'm interested in. I'm uh, I'm pleased when I find out that uh, a game that I'd made years prior is still fondly remembered. So that's uh, that's so that that's that it's kind of an afterthought to it. It's never, making a game timeless is never my main thought. It's uh, it's sort of something I appreciate long after after the game's released. Of course. So when you started working for 3DO. Can you talk to me what that was like creating your own team and probably longer hours, you know, maybe more stressful experience with, with the success of Heroes 2? You know, what was that like working that atmosphere? Well, well, it was a great atmosphere because it was a great team. So, uh, so I enjoyed everyone I worked with. Management was pretty hands off all throughout the experience. Uh, I, I worked directly under the, the general manager, um, Mark Caldwell. But I think uh, in the first six months, I think we only had like one meeting. Really? <laughs> That's how hands off it was. Yeah. That's very uh, lucky. And my des- my designer Greg had maybe had weekly meetings with uh, John Ben Canahan. Uh, so uh, uh, so yeah, they were they were pretty hands off uh, on the project. So it was a great experience. It the hours did get long toward the end, uh, but you know. Uh, uh, it, was, it was enjoyable work, so I didn't mind the long hours. My, my, my wife probably minded it. I'm sure she did much more than I did, uh, but, but I didn't mind the long hours. So it was, I mean, that was easily the most pleasurable development experience I ever had. Uh, and I, I think it shows, shows in the final product. For sure. Is there any crazier stories about you know develop, developing this game? Because I know the studio like working in the video game space at that time was kind of the wild wild west and i maybe wasn't as structured and corporate as it is today or you you said you don't have a meeting for six months i mean find a corporate american job today where where that's a possibility is there any crazy yeah. experience from that time and crunches and deadlines and there were there were there were there were more uh, crazy stories with the sequel for the game uh or rather expansions of the game we uh, so the, the company was developed was was concurrently developing two product lines. There was Heroes of Mind Magic, which was the, the turn based strategy game, and Mind Magic, which uh, was the uh, role playing game, both set in the same universe. Uh, and if anything, probably the Mind, the Mind Magic role playing game was a lead product of our studio, it was the A product, and Heroes of Mind Magic was the B product. Um, and so we would we would look at what they were doing in the next Mind Magic and then kind of take away from that in, in doing Heroes of Mind Magic. And uh, even though it was a fantasy game, the, 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 the Mind Magic universe was, was a fantasy universe, there was actually a science fiction element to it and that all these fantasy creatures were really the products of science fiction technology. And so to emulate what they were doing over on the role-playing game side, in in one expansion, we uh, we, uh, we we incorporate science fiction elements. So we would have um, we would have uh, dwarves with with ray guns and minotaurs with jetpacks and uh, nagas that were integrated into tanks. So huge science fiction element. And so we we were in the early conceptual phases. And uh, our, our marketing director came up to me and said, do you have any artwork I can show the fans? Because they, they want to see what's going on. So I went and reached down to the pile of, of concept art. We had, all right, show this. And unfortunately, uh, I made an error in not choosing things a little bit more carefully because some of the, uh, some of, some of the concept art was a little less family friendly uh, in some of its uh, depictions of female characters than, than the final product would have been. Uh, so when when the next day when that uh, when when that concept art was released online, there was an outcry from the fans about here how dare we mix science fiction with their fantasy and how how dare we make this a not family friendly game, and within a couple of days they were launching a boycott of it. When uh, was Heroes ever a and, family uh, game? I'm confused about that part of the of the sentence. I guess. <laughs> Well, uh, the, there's so many elements of heroes, demons, dragons, you know, like getting burned alive by a dragon, you know, like there's so much. Right? Well, the thing about Americans were were a little bit more accepting of violence than we are of sexuality. Ah, that makes so sense. that's sure. that, I think that's what it was. If, if, 
if we had if we had released this in Europe, no problem, you know, strictly. But this was American audiences, so uh, so uh, and of course, I I knew what we were going to do be doing would be cool, and uh, I I, I want to just be patient, tell the fans it's going to be okay. Slowly convince them over to our side, but uh, management freaked out. And uh, they told us to cancel. Oh my God! Uh, cancel, cancel this expansion and come up with something new. So we came up with, with something uh, that I think was, I, I think that that's where we came up with an elemental town uh, instead of a uh, instead of a uh, instead of a, a science fiction oriented town. Um, so yeah, we uh, so we, we so under orders, we we changed our plans. But I got to tell you, years later, I've heard some fans say. You know that that science fiction town would have been really cool, and yeah, it would have been sure. would have been would have been nice. And it was a, it was an expansion after all. It wasn't part of the main game. It was something you add on you could buy if you wanted to. But uh, no, I, I thought we caved too easily to that. So that, that's probably the weirdest thing that went on. L- looking back at the time when this game came out, it kind of makes sense as to why there was so much ar- outrage about this. Because I remember talking to Sandy about his Doom release in 1993, and there was a big um, government effort to talk about violence in video games, and, you know, the government was basically painting games as, like, this evil that we have to stop children from playing. So it kind of makes sense, I guess, where this mob mentality, you know, against the studio would come from. Yeah, that, yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was around the time that, uh, what, uh, what, Mortal Kombat came out? Doom, 1993, 1991, 92, like in the, in the early 90s, that's when like there was a government kind of, in the U.S., I believe, kind of clamping down on violence in video games, right? Yeah, yeah, they, 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 yeah, there was, it was a couple of senators, it was a... Uh, right, I think was, Hillary Clinton uh, was also in there, some, I can't remember, some yeah, big politician. A little bit, but not as much, not, not as much as, uh, boy, I... Not, I, the, the names are on the tip of my tongue. I, sh- I, I certainly should know it. No worries. Um, but uh, but yeah, they 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 they, be, they basically challenged the video game industry. They said you either regulate yourselves or we're going to regulate you. So that's when we came up with the ESRB and the rating system. Yeah, Mortal Kombat in 1992. Yeah, around that, that uh, time. That makes that, sense. It was around that time. Now this this was actually here's my magic. So this 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 was like six seven years later. Um, afterwards, but yeah, there there was still a sensitivity about violence in game, games at that time. Um, but but yeah, we we weren't really hurt, hit for for the violence. In fact, uh, Heroes of My Magic was not a uh, was not a, uh, a a very graphic game no, at it was all. Very tame, I mean, yeah. Graphic to violence, it was very tame in that way. No, it was it was more more of the sexuality that was. Uh, the, the 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 feared sexuality of having a, a large-breasted female characters in the game, which uh, no, we would we would not have put in. It was just that one particular artist who happened to do that concept art just happened to draw, draw it that way. Uh, it was Unlucky not, was that final, but yeah, was, uh, again, my, my fault for for not being a, a better editor and what we were uh, showing to uh, showing to to our, our our fans of what we were working on. Something I wanted to really ask you was, um, so when I played this game, I was maybe seven, eight, nine. I barely spoke English, I would say. So I didn't really remember the names of towns. I didn't remember character names. I didn't remember, let's say, the more fundamental things. But I had this childlike enjoyment of the game where when I eventually started playing when I was 13, 14... When I got into a turn-based battle, I would know exactly what the outcome is, or pretty close, just by looking at the picture of the, oh, this is a dragon from this city, it's going to attack this skeleton, it's going to do, like, and I would be maybe one or two off from how many units he would lose. So, talking about the balance in the game and the structure, uh, the calculations behind the damage system, were you involved in any of that, or or were you just uh, an outsider for that kind of stuff? Well, my my designer was involved with it, Greg Fulton. He would uh, he would he would every week he'd get together with uh, John Van Canaham, uh, who who created the 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 the, the, the very first heroes of my magic game, although it was called uh, King's Bounty. We call it's what we refer to it as uh, Heroes of Might Magic Zero. 
the game King's Bounty. Um, so he, he, they get together and they would run spreadsheet simulations of different characters fighting each other. So they program in the stats and then, you know, and then put in the battle calculations and then run, you know, run uh, hundreds of battles against each other to figure out who would win what percentage at the time as a result of these battles. And that way they, they would go and balance them out um, uh, the way they wanted. So uh, I was uh, I, I was familiar with the process, and I'd hear about the results of their of their get-togethers, and then we tweak things appropriately. But uh, a key thing in, in 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 Heroes was that we wanted you to be able to look at a particular creature and be able to tell how strong it was compared to other creatures, and get some sense about what its special attacks were. So it was it was all about. Having having the visuals communicate the function, form communicating function. Uh, that that was really important to us, and I think was is one of the things that that made made the game stand out because it was just it was so easy to use. You just look at it, and yeah, you knew like, what was going on, yeah. and what was likely to happen. So that so the visuals aided and aided uh, the players in their strategic decisions. I'm living proof of that because I had no knowledge of English or you know basic mathematics, and I would kind of understand. Well, oh, this is a bigger creature, higher power. This is a, a big dragon. This is a skinny little skeleton. I would know right away. Okay, this is how that's going to go down. Yeah, you know, I was always, I was always, I've always wondered why is the game so popular in, in Europe and especially Eastern Europe? And maybe that's one of the reasons maybe it was because we were, we were successful in creating a visual language for the game that, that really transcended language barriers. And it was a perfect genre for, I think Eastern European uh, folk who love, you know, RTS games that love turn-based games. For some reason, that part of the world, I'm not sure why, but really enjoys those games. And did the system, the damage system come from Dungeons and Dragons a little bit or, what was the, I guess, origin of that kind of stuff? I don't, I, I don't know what the origin was. We, 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 we borrowed a lot of, from Heroes of My Magic 2. In fact, we used the same game engine as Heroes of My Magic 2. So, uh, and, and we did want to be, you know, we were, we were a sequel. So we didn't want to, we wanted to add to and maybe modify a little bit. So we didn't want to do our, our, uh, a dramatic departure from what was done before. So uh, a, lot, a lot of the basic, uh, basic uh, equations were, were the same. Did you understand the balance behind the game? Because there's so many different ways you can kind of... It's very different from a game of, like, let's say Age of Empires, which is really balanced from, from a, you know, general perspective. You have civilizations, they are all have their strengths and weaknesses, but they're all competitive within a certain, let's say, realm, and they're in their own scope. Heroes is very different, because there's so many ways to exploit the game, let's say, to become, you know... I, diplomacy from um what what the witches stockpiling a bunch of witches um were you aware of that like this is how the game would be played and the people would find these exploits and and really push the game to its limits well uh, the, the, when it's wasn't hard to, to to it's not hard to imagine that that would happen i mean that the game is it's so complex you got you had uh, eight different towns and each one had a what, seven different creatures that you can control and you had heroes to lead the towns that had different abilities and there were there were there were, like, there were dozens of different heroes and then different magic spells and each of those uh uh had, had their effects and then there there's so many power-ups and bonuses and, and right the so much bonuses the player yeah, bonuses i mean a huge number of combinations and you know, some things work better than others. I still, fans still come to me today and go, how could you put Eagle Eye into the game? That's <laughs> such a terrible spell. And it's like, what? You only found one thing wrong with it? That's that's, that's pretty, pretty good, good yeah. out of the thousands of different combinations. Um, but yeah, um, I always, the more complex the game, the more opportunity for exploits. Uh, but we had a real good testing team. We had, we had a lot of level designers who were really good. Uh, so they create maps and they, you know, they, they, in creating the maps, they find problems with the, with the creatures and the heroes and the, and all the power-ups and all the spells and such. And then uh, we had a good testing team that would just play through the game over and over and over and they'd find all the problems with it. Right. And it so gets harder and harder to balance, right? As, as you add more, you know, variables, it gets almost impossible yeah. to balance. Yeah. Any new thing can knock everything else out of whack. So, uh, yeah. 
it, it, it's, it's a very challenging job. What do you think about today's esports scene, especially in Poland with Heroes Might and Magic? Is this something that blows your mind that people 20 years later are playing this competitively for, for one thing, and then two, it's popularity, like it's videos for Heroes Might and Magic get like a couple hundred thousand views. People are watching Heroes competitively, where it's like a very tough game to watch competitively. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, esports in general surprises me. I mean, esports is going bigger and bigger and bigger with each year. And, uh, you know, that it's kind of even during the pandemic, whereas regular physical sports uh, was kind of put on hold, you still have esports going on. So, uh, so yeah, uh, the popularity of esports, uh, I, it's not something that personally uh, attracts me. I, I, I don't, I don't get the interest in watching someone else play a game. I'd rather be playing it myself, but uh, I certainly appreciate that other people get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I take note of how, how big esports is today. And yeah, I'm, I'm aware that, that people do play heroes of my magic free competitively. It's uh it's pretty wild, um, but you know, it's, you know, it is a it is a competitive game. There's multiplayer modes in it, so yeah. It's Why not? Competition. Yeah, have fun. Yeah, but like it's such a it's such a weird one for me because this hero is such a fun solo or let's say with a friend experience. But it's I mean, watching six hours of turn based combat. It's not like it's not like end to end stuff like Counter Strike or like a shooting game. It's like there's so many people that are willing to sit down and watch six hours of turn based combat, which is what really I don't know to me it seems absolutely insane. There's not many games that are turn based combat competitively. Yeah. Unless you well, I'll tell you though. Combat. <laughs> one nice thing about turn base, it's easier for for uh, for uh, for uh, observers uh, to 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 see what's going on and 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 what what moves they're making, what why 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 they're making the moves versus a, a faster. I think it's harder with a, a faster pace game. Um, so that that part I, I actually understand. Um, I also understand of all the games I've made. Um, Heroes is the only one I enjoyed playing after I released it. Everything else, I was just sick of. Right. Uh, like the same. I, I didn't want to see it again. <laughs> it's like eating the but same yeah, food every day. Yeah, but Hero, Heroes of My Magic Three that that was fun to play after I released it. So uh, I I do get the appeal of the game, and uh, so I I that that game I do understand why why other people. Do you have a favorite play. strategy? I was going to ask. Do you have a favorite strategy that you would use, like basic di like di diplomacy or power liches, or did you have a thing that you always went to when you played, or no? Oh, it's been a while since I played it. Um, I, uh, I I probably relied more on might than I did magic. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I, and I certainly I placed a lot of emphasis on on the uh, on the armies I was putting together. Um, I. Uh, I probably relied too much on uh, uh, on, on, on getting my uh, town as wealthy uh, as possible by building the building uh, uh, building uh, the money center, generating town structures yeah. first. Right, right. Um, and in retrospect, probably focus on on on, uh, on things that would uh, that would improve my my ability in combat uh, first. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I did have a strategy, but I can't say that it was a very good strategy. <laughs> right. That's kind of funny to, to, you know, say from a guy that made the game, you would think he would have the ultimate, you know, tricks up his sleeve type, uh, type thing. Well, that's the, the funny thing is when you're making a game, you don't have as much time to play it. Uh, so I certainly, you know, certainly spent some time each day playing the game, but uh, not on the level that, that uh, really good players, you know, do once the game is released. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I have all very little free time when I'm in the middle of game development, you know, when you're working 68 hours a week, uh, not much time left over for gameplay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's understandable. Do you think there is a future for, um, heroes? This is an interesting topic for me because, um, age or sorry, um, age of empires, the definitive edition is a game that's still thriving today and believe it or not is getting, you know, tens and 20, 30, 40,000 people watching its competitive scene. Do you think there's a hope for, I, I think, a remaster maybe, or some sort of, you know, I think a remaster would be tough because you kind of have to remaster a game that's also eSports, you know, compatible and all these other things. 
Well, uh, Ubisoft now owns the franchise. They bought it from 3DO when 3DO went under, and they've been they've been making new games uh, in the franchise. I, I, I think they've I stopped. Know, I think 2016 the was the last. I think 2016 or 2017 was the last year they worked on that game or that franchise. But but a couple of years ago, they made Heroes Three Remastered. They did. They did yes. remaster it. Yeah, they did. They they put in all new graphics uh, into it, and. Uh, and then they also did uh, they did some mobile mobile games for the Chinese market. Yes, uh, because yeah. the, uh, what's his name? He he went to work for the Chinese company, right? Uh, forgot the name. Ten- Tenet or no, I can't remember. Uh, John. Tencent? Yes, yes, Tencent, right? J- John went to work for them or no? He might. I, I know he worked for one of them. I, I forgot which one. It could have been Tencent. Uh, it's just a uh, quick search here. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. He went to work for them. That makes sense. Uh, there was there was a few other things. Sorry, too. We're a little bit over. I apologize. Um, I'm just there's a lot I wanted to ask you. So um, there's a few games that are kind of in the works actually uh, that are kind of going to be the future. Let's say Heroes Mind Magic. There's a game called so- um, Songs of Conquest. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. If you want to give that a search, or I can share a screen. I think it's really close, if not almost identical to like. Well, maybe not identical, but very similar to what the old Magic games were like. Um, it's scheduled to come out in um, 2022. Looks like the studio Coffee Stain. A turn-based strategy game inspired by 90s classics. Yes. All right. Uh, well, certainly that... It, it does, I'm, I'm scrolling through it now. It certainly does look like... Uh, I see I see uh, graphics. Remind me of Heroes of My Magic 3. All right. So I'll have to be paying attention to that one. Yeah, I, I just found it about recently. All right. Now, something I should share with you is that my uh, the hero, Heroes of My Magic 3's designer, Greg Fulton, is currently developing on his own a uh, spiritual successor for Heroes of My Magic 3 um, called... Uh, Boy, I I also have and Stratix, I think it is. I have this on my notes, yeah, but I don't have the uh, name of it. Yeah, you know, it's I, I keep telling him to change that name, my name because it just it doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, but uh, here, let's see if I can. Yeah, Fan Stratix. Fan Stratix, yeah, what it's called. <laughs> yeah, actually, I emailed him. I was wondering if he wanted to be a guest, but he's not really. He doesn't do a lot of podcasts. But I did. I uh, just briefly have a chat with him about that. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, he, he and I talk uh, uh, now and then, and uh, and uh, he keeps surprised about what he's doing. Yeah, he he'd much rather have me go out and promote the game than uh, <laughs> and do it himself, which I'm, I'm more than happy to do. Uh, but in fact, love to be even greater involved with it at some point uh, 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 in the future. Um, but uh, for those who are interested, uh, the, he does have a newsletter I'll leave available a link down for below. it. Mm-hmm. Just Great, perfect. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, but yeah, if, if anyone kn- knows uh, what are the elements that made a game like Heroes of My Magic Three successful, Greg is the person to do it, and I, I would trust him to incorporate those into a new game. Does he actually so give you like, like notes, or like he talks to you about what he's doing, like, or is he just like general conversation? Oh, he. Uh, I, I, I get some details. Really? Oh. I get some details. You, you bet. And uh, I have. Uh, yeah, okay. I have details. Go, cool, go. Cool. Yeah, obviously, don't. Yeah, don't say anything. But yeah, uh, I'm, no, I, I. That's awesome. They will be revealed at the appropriate time. That's awesome, Greg. If he sees this, you're always welcome to be on the pod. Talk about whatever product you're working on, because I'm really excited about that. I, I did hear about that. And I want to talk to you about it, but it seems like you already know quite a bit. So. If you're optimistic, I'm I'm optimistic. I am optimistic, and you should be too. And anyone else who's a Heroes Three fan should be optimistic as well. Beautiful, um, David. Believe it or not, we've done an hour and twelve minutes. I really enjoyed this. Is there something you want to promote, plug you're working on? Uh, let's see. Well, I, if if I were if I were promo- plugging anything, it would be Fence Stratix. Yep. Uh, I am working on some things of my own, but unfortunately, I'm, they're they're not a stage where I can talk about them. Okay, yet. no worries. Um, regardless, I enjoyed this very much. You're welcome back anytime. I really enjoy talking to you. Well, thank you, thank you. Time flew by. Time that's that's literally the best thing anyone could tell a, a host of a podcast. So, once again, thanks for coming by.